Thank you, Brian, for your very kind and gracious introduction. It's good to be with you tonight. I'm sorry I don't play basketball like the uh, Lady Razorbacks do, but um, hopefully we'll offer a good alternative to that game. I um, <clears throat> have about an hour's worth of material to tell you in about a half an hour of time. Jimmy Buskirk, the pastor from the uh, church in Oklahoma, used to say when he was in that predicament that he was going to talk fast and you had to listen fast. So um, what I need is my presentation. It's in behind me. Okay. Oh, it would help if I turned it on. There we go. So what I'm here for tonight is um, hopefully to answer three questions. How in the heck did we get into this mess as a United Methodist Church? Why does separation seem to be the best solution to our crisis? And where would a new tra traditional Methodist denomination go? What would it look like following a potential separation that we might experience. I've uh, served for, in pastoral ministry for 29 years before coming on with Good News full-time and um, so I understand these things from the perspective of the local church and how it impacts the people in the pew and the ministries of the churches. And It's important to understand a little bit about the, the things that have led us to this point that because many people are just becoming aware of the problems that exist in our denomination. And when that happens, people say, well, why is this all of a sudden coming about? And it's not just coming about all of a sudden. It's just that many of us have not been aware because it hasn't really impacted many local churches. And so, what I want to do tonight is just kind of give you the 30,000 foot level look at what has been happening in our church and how we might go forward. We have to go back 140 years to find the root of the problem that exists today. The German theological liberalism school influenced theological education in the United States starting in the, 19, or the 1880s. And the seminaries are where pastors are trained and especially in the early part of the 1900s, bishops and other church leaders. And the, this school of thought created doubt about the validity of scripture. It believed that the Bible is not God's self-revelation but rather a record of human encounters with God. And when you think of the Bible that way, you start to think, well, maybe some of those human encounters weren't valid, or maybe they don't speak to me today. Maybe they weren't true. Maybe there was somebody's experience, but they were wrong about things. And pretty soon, you can become a judge of Scripture rather than Scripture being over you in authority. Well, fast forward to 1968, which was the founding of the United Methodist Church. If you um, might be aware that the United Methodist Church is the result of a merger between the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church. My grandfather was a pastor in the Evangelical United Brethren Church, and uh, so I grew up in the family, but a different branch of the family from the Methodist Church. But at the time of the merger, they tried to come up with an understanding of what do we believe as United Methodists? And they, they um, came upon this idea called doctrinal pluralism. Doctrinal pluralism means that you can believe a variety of different things, even contradictory things, and still be a part of the same church. So you can have people who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, with, along with people that believe that Jesus was just a human being who was extraordinarily gifted. All those beliefs are accepted. And that 
paved the way for the problem that we have today. There has never been a time in the, since 1968 when we agreed as a church on what we believe. And so we encounter um, the problems theologically that we experience today. Pastor Tony alluded to the Wesley and quadrilateral, scripture, tradition, reason, experience. The problem with theological pluralism is that it creates these things as equals and makes tradition, experience, and reason equal to scripture. And you can take any one of them as your authority. That's not what we believe as United Methodists on paper, but it's what we believe in practice in many cases. The Articles of Religion are really one of our doctrinal standards, and I just want to point out a sentence in this particular article. It says, Whatever is not read therein in Scripture, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. If it's not in the Bible, it can't be required of us to believe. The Confession of Faith that comes from the, the Evangelical United Brethren side says almost exactly the same thing. Whatever is not revealed in or established by the Holy Scriptures is not to be made an article of faith, nor is it to be taught as essential to salvation. But if you can believe anything you want and still be United Methodist, how does that fit together with what we say about Scripture? It doesn't fit, and that's why we have cognitive dissonance in our church today. We have people who are confused, people who believe all kinds of things. We have clergy and bishops who deny the basic tenets of the Christian faith. We have our morality and ethics being determined by cultural values and not grounded in scripture. This is the theological underpinning of the problem in our church today. Now, unfortunately, this has all come about in a presenting issue, which is the church's ministry with LGBTQ persons. I say unfortunately because it's much, it would be much better if we could just talk about the real issues which are the authority of scripture and who is Jesus and what is salvation but as a friend of mine said at general conference you don't generally take an up or down vote on Jesus those issues come out in other ways and in this case the issue has become homosexuality It's a matter of interpretation and authority. What is our authority? Is our authority scripture? Is our authority the culture? Are we trying to be on the right side of history? Or is our authority God's word? Both uh, Bruce and Tony explained the traditional view. In our book of discipline it says, all individuals are of sacred worth. All are created in the image of God. All need the ministry of the church. God's grace is available to all. We welcome and forgive and love all people. This is what the church is all about. We implore families and churches not to reject or condemn lesbians and gay members and friends. We commit ourselves to be in ministry for and with all people. This is an expression of God's love and grace for everyone, and that is the stance of our church. At the same time, we also say that our church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. You can link it very clearly to the Bible story that Bruce read to us earlier about the woman caught in adultery. 
Jesus did not condemn her, he forgave her. But he also taught her what was right and what was wrong. He said, go and leave your life of sin. Obviously, committing adultery is against God's will. Not because God is a, a heavenly killjoy, but because God knows what's best for us. And so he says, please don't do that. In the same way, the church can welcome all people, offer God's grace, love, and forgiveness, offer acceptance and welcome, and at the same time say, God's will for our human sexuality is within marriage between one man and one woman. And that's for everybody. No matter what our desires or inclinations might be, Many of us here wrestle with inclinations toward heterosexual infidelity. That's probably more of a problem in our society today than homosexuality is. We don't bless those desires that are contrary to God's will. Instead, we offer the resources of God's grace, mercy, forgiveness, and support, and the power of the Holy Spirit to be changed, to be transformed, to become the kind of person that God wants us to be. Sorry, I'll get to preaching here. <clears throat> this traditional view has been in our church since 1972, and it's been reaffirmed, as Bruce said, 13 times at every general conference since then. But there's a dissenting view, and it's important to notice that this dissenting view arose in the 1950s and 1960s at the time of the sexual revolution when all the boundaries around sexuality were being challenged and it carried over into this particular issue. People who have a dissenting view believe that the biblical writers were misinformed. Um, they, didn't they weren't aware that you could have a loving, mutual relationship between two persons of the same gender. Um, the biblical teaching is discounted in favor of human experience. If you listen to uh, people like Adam Hamilton, he'll say, well, you know, I've met some same-sex people who are wonderfully Christian and loving and kind, and I've experienced that, therefore, we must affirm those kind of relationships. Experience trumps the Word of God. And the dissenting view, of course, affirms same-sex relationships, but many would go even farther than that and say any kind of sexual relationship between any two people, or maybe not just two people, as long as it's not exploitative, is affirmed and accepted. That's a pathway away from God's intention for our human sexuality. So... For 50 years, we have had different opinions in our church. That has not caused the crisis. The crisis in our church started in 2011 when we began to have not only different opinions in our church, but also different practices in our church. There began to be an organized effort by clergy to perform same-sex weddings, Bishops began to say, I'm not going to enforce the Book of Discipline. I'm going to look for loopholes. I'm going to look for ways around these rules that we have in our discipline that says pastors can't do same-sex weddings and can't be ordained if you're a practicing lesbian or gay person. There were statements by up to a dozen different annual conference boards of ordained ministry that said, we don't care what the discipline says. We're going to recommend practicing homosexuals for ordination. We even had a retired bishop who performed two high-profile same-sex weddings without any consequences. So the church can exist with differences of opinion, but the church cannot exist with differences of practice. We either believe one thing and live one way, or we believe a different thing and believe a different way. We can't be both. So in 2016, the General Conference was on the verge of chaos, and an emotional appeal was addressed to the Council of Bishops saying, please lead us. 
and they began to form or formed this Commission on a Way Forward that you may have heard of. I had the privilege of being a part of that group and we met for a year and a half and uh, this process took a total of three years to get to the special general conference that we just had in February of last year. The uh, Commission on the Way Forward, I would describe it as a last-ditch effort to find a way to keep the church together. And it came with two different plans, something called the One Church Plan and something called the Traditional Plan. Let me find my notes here where I'm at. <clears throat> and so the, uh, the One Church Plan was the idea that we can be all together even though we have different practices. Local churches can decide for themselves whether they want same-sex marriage or not. They can decide whether they want a gay pastor or not. Annual conferences can decide if they want to ordain gay persons as clergy or not. Just leave it up to everybody. Turn us into more of a congregational type of system. The traditional plan said no. We should all have the same practice in the church and the standards for ordination and the conduct of pastors should be the same for everybody. Well the, the traditional plan won 53 to 47. In politics that's a pretty good margin. In the church it's not considered to be a very wide margin at all. And so that was what happened in St. Louis. 2019 February. Um, the exit ramp that was passed for those, part of the traditional plan was we recognized that there were some who could not live with the church's position as it is now. So let's provide an exit ramp, a non-punitive way for people who can't live with the, the church's position. Well the exit ramp that was passed was actually uh, much too expensive for most local churches to afford and so it was not effective. The other issue is the, the traditional plan had a, a, a way to hold bishops accountable because bishops hold the um, the reins of what happens when somebody disobeys. If the bishop decides we're not going to enforce the discipline that's the end of it. So we had to have accountability for bishops, but it turns out that no plan was developed that was actually able to pass constitutional muster and also pass the general conference that could hold bishops accountable. What happened after St. Louis was literally all hell broke loose. We had 28 of our 54 U.S. annual conferences pass resolutions opposing the traditional plan. In Denmark and Germany, they made plans to either separate or remove from the Book of Discipline the parts that they disagreed with. A dozen bishops have, do, uh, have said, we're not going to enforce the discipline. And of course, in a couple of months after General Conference, we had a uh, woman who's married to another woman elected as bishop in the Western jurisdiction. Why did the 2019 Special General Conference not resolve the issue? Well, a majority of the bishops and clergy in the United States have decided they're not going to obey the discipline. And we have no way to hold them accountable in our church structure the way it is constructed today. The only way to do it would be to change the Constitution, which, cha which requires a two-thirds vote of the General Conference and a two-thirds vote of all the annual conferences around the world. There's no chance that we could get a two-thirds majority to adopt a change that would hold bishops accountable. So we're stuck. We are now a church in the schism. We have part of the church living one way, in another part of the church living another way. How do we resolve the problem? Well, just about everybody has come to the point of accepting the reality that we are going to have a separation of some kind. Why separation? 
if there, because there's no accountability for bishops or clergy in many parts of the country. The church's real crisis is our loss of membership. That's been camouflaged by all of this fighting. But we're declining as a denomination 2 to 3 percent per year. If that keeps up very long, pretty soon we won't have a church left. But we're so busy fighting with each other that we can't address the membership decline. It's hurting the ministry of our churches. People are withholding their giving. The Episcopal Fund that pays bishops is going to run out of money within the next three or four years. The general church has cut the budget by 18 percent. Small churches are dwindling away and closing at a record pace. If we keep doing what we are doing, we will be declining even more steeply. The infighting that's going on in our church is damaging our witness because who wants to join a church that's fighting, right? And if we aren't sure what we believe as United Methodists, how can we invite people to come and be a part of that? So it's really gotten to the point where separation is the only way to end the conflict between us and allow different groups to walk separately in a different way from each other. Now the, the question I always get is why should traditionalists be the ones to separate. That's what the protocol calls for. And I think I missed a slide. No, I didn't. So, so the protocol, and you, you, if you were here last time for Brian's talk, you heard more about the protocol and the details of that. I'm not going to cover those details tonight, but I can answer questions if you have questions about the protocol during the question and answer time. But the protocol says those who um, that the, the, the continuing on United Methodist Church is going to change its position. It's going to become affirming of same-sex relationships, allow same-sex marriage, allow for ordination of practicing homosexuals. And if you don't want that, then you have to vote to separate from the United Methodist Church and form something new. Now the biggest complaint is why should we leave and start something new when we are the majority globally in the church? And the answer is most progressives refuse to leave. It would make sense as a matter of integrity that if you're trying to change the church and the church says 13 times no, that maybe you should be the one to find a different church that agrees with your beliefs or form something new. But that's not how they think. The progressives believe that it's their mission to change the church, to change us, to change our minds, to get us to accept and affirm something that we believe is wrong. So they're going to stay, and most of them will stay and fight till the last person is there. And there's no way to hold them accountable. There's no way to even help to remove them from the church. It would take hundreds of trials, church trials, for that to happen. And because bishops control the process, and a majority of the bishops are not going to use the process, we're stuck. There's no way for us to, to carry out what the discipline says. A conflict-based resolution to our crisis does not serve the church or its witness well. We saw this in St. Louis. How many of you watched the live stream or saw some of the, the happenings in St. Louis? It made me sick to my stomach to watch some of what was going on there, some of what was said. That's not going to help the church. That's not going to help us move forward. The general agencies of the church, you know, one of the reasons for trying to, to stay, to keep the church for ourselves would be because of all the structure and the agencies and stuff. But the agencies are not traditional. The agencies are all controlled by persons who have a pro progressive viewpoint. 
and they're unreformable. Most of the agencies do not really help the local church become more effective in ministry. In fact, sometimes they harm the ministry of the local church. But we can't reform them because they have a very powerful lobbying process and very much influence at general conference. So all, for all these reasons, it's better for us to just start over. The system is messed up. There's no way to make it right. So let's not pour our energy into a losing battle that would take another 20 years. Let's instead pour our energy into starting something new that can glorify God and help the church to become effective. That's really what we want, isn't it? So let's not hang on to an, an outmoded institution, but let's move into a new reality that allows us to do something new and fresh for the 21st century church. That's why we are the ones to separate. So what would a new traditional Methodist denomination look like? Well, obviously, that will be determined by an inaugural general conference of a new denomination. It's not something I can determine. Those of us that are part of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, by the way, how many, members, how many of you are members of the Wesleyan Covenant Association? That's one thing that you can do, is join the Wesleyan Covenant Association, put your money into being a member of that, because that's what's building the new thing. The Wesleyan Covenant Association has been working on a uh, proposed book of doctrines and discipline that would constitute a new denomination in a new way. And so the ideas that I'm sharing with you tonight are ideas that the Wesleyan Covenant Association, the WCA, is putting forward as a proposal. Obviously, when the new denomination starts, those who start it are going to have to approve that. So it's not, you know, set in stone. And I'm sure many of these things will be tweaked and changed and all that. But this is kind of a general idea of what we have in mind for a new denomination. What would it look like? Well, it would be based on fidelity to Methodist doctrinal standards. Right now, you can become a clergy person even though you disagree with our doctrinal standards. And you can preach and teach things that are not according to our doctrinal standards. In a new traditionalist denomination, that won't be the case. Pastors are going to be expected to believe and teach and preach our doctrines. That's a novel thought. And what that means is that you don't have to worry that the pastor that is assigned to your church is going to be teaching you things that aren't biblically accurate or true. That happens so often today where a progressive-minded, theologically progressive pastor is placed in a church that is fairly conservative and there, is, there are sparks that fly, let's put it that way. It's not helpful. We believe in something, let's base our church on what we believe. And that's what the new denomination would do. It would be a global church based on ministry partnerships between the U.S. and Africa, Europe, and the Philippines. Do you know that half of our membership is outside the United States right now? The church is exploding in Africa, and in the Philippines it's growing. In parts of Europe it's growing. We, we can form partnerships with them where they can help us learn once again our first love and how to reach people for Christ. And we can help them become better at some of the things that we're good at. That's the kind of mutual ministry that needs to take place. We will hopefully have a leaner denominational structure without a lot of boards and agencies. Instead, we can partner with existing ministries where possible and only form those agencies that are necessary. We can make sure that the focus of the general church is to resource the local church. 
to put the local church first and to enable the local church, equip the local church to be effective. And of course the result of all that will be lower apportionments. More money can be spent on mission and ministry both locally and globally rather than supporting boards and agencies that are not effective. In the new thing, local churches will have a greater say in who their pastor is. We're not going to go to a call system, but we're going to allow local church staff parish relations committees to have a much greater say in accepting or not a certain person as their pastor. We would place our emphasis on discipleship and spiritual formation. This is what the church is all about, making disciples of Jesus Christ. Too often in our current denomination, the church is seen as a political arm of religion. That our job is to pass laws and advocate for policies in the public sphere, which some of that is great, but that's not the purpose of the church. The, purpose, the primary purpose of the church is to make, make disciples, to help us grow in our faith, to become all that God wants us to be, to live it out in our everyday lives. And that should be the focus. There would be a return and emphasis on church planting across the United States. Out in the western two-thirds of our country, geographically, there are very few evangelical United Methodist churches. And the progressives say, well, that's because only progressive churches grow out here in the West. We're in a different context. You guys don't understand us. But if you go to the West Coast today, you will find thriving, large, evangelical, non-denominational churches. The West is wide open for evangelism. And we can do that with a new denomination. We can have a denomination that has greater accountability for bishops and pastors. Bishops would be elected globally, not by a certain region, and they would be accountable globally, not just to a certain region. Our denomination standards would be enforced. There would be greater freedom for annual conferences and local churches to structure themselves. Rather than having a straitjacket imposed upon you, you can determine what works best in your particular situation. As long as you care for certain key functions, you should be able to structure your church the way you think is the best. And the way that this church is structured will be a lot different from the church down the road that has 100 people in it. And the way this church is structured will be a lot different from the, the way that a church in Africa is structured. That kind of flexibility can be happening when we have unity of belief and theology. Right now what we have in our denomination is backwards. We have no unity when it comes to theology and beliefs and so we try to impose unity structurally by saying everybody's got to do the same thing the same way. That's totally backwards. We should have unity of our faith and then let the structure be adaptable. And we envision a quicker pathway to ordination for people who want to go into the ministry. It shouldn't take them six years to be ordained. And we shouldn't have second class citizens license local pastors. They should be equivalent in status and able to vote on everything and not just a few things. Well, those are just some general ideas about the kind of thing that we envision in a potential new denomination. There's a lot of details to be filled in and that process is ongoing. But I, have out, I run out of time here and so we're going to open it up to you. If you have a question